So uh, I'm, I'll start, I guess. Uh. Okay. Joining me now, live in my luxurious cavernous mansion in uh, Beverly Hills, California, is the legendary Paul Zigo. Yeah, this is a beautiful mansion, by the way. Is this a zebra? Yeah, that is zebra. Jesus it's very Christ. delicious. Yeah. It's very African. Yeah, it's a, it's a sexy, palatial estate. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so you are the legendary Paul Zigo. What makes you better than everyone else, Paul? What, what makes me better than everybody else? Yeah, uh, that, that's that's a good question. I'm uh, about sick of your condescending attitude, sir. <laughs> I, uh, what makes me better than most people in this country? I can give you that answer. Uh, All right, go ahead. I'm not a fucking moron. Uh, <laughs> stupidity, uh, stupidity in this country is passed down, you know, from generation to generation, father to son, mother to daughter, like some sort of congenital birth defect, and somehow I dodged the bullet. So there you go. I'm sorry, I lost you a genital, and it just everything stopped right there. Um, you're you're a you are an actor by uh, profession, hobby, what? Uh, hobby, hobby. If I told you I was an actor by profession, I'd be a I'd be a, a liar. <laughs> it's definitely a hobby. I work a uh, a job that's not horrible but not fulfilling at all, and I act whenever I have the time to do, which lately has been hardly ever, but. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. That's uh-huh. interesting. What what uh what got you into that exactly? You uh you got into that in high school or before that even or what? Bef- when, when when did you get your flair for the uh, theatrical? Your flamboyant early you know homosexual tendencies of. Uh... <laughs> well, that, that's actually an interesting question. I was raised uh, in an alcoholic household, and it was a constant party when I was growing up. And um, I spent most of my childhood from, I'd say, around five to, uh, fuck, when I moved out of my parents' house, uh, entertaining drunk people. And, man, I'm telling you what, there's nothing funnier than a kid with a slightly quick wit uh, to a bunch of drunk idiots. (laughs) And so, uh, you know, that's, that's, I think, where the desire to act came from. I got my first role in a play in the fourth grade, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm an attention whore, you know. I love I love the audience feedback. I love, you know, it's just boner inducing to be up in front of uh, you know, a whole audience filled with people uh, and all of them are focused on every word that you're saying. It's the same reason I make YouTube videos. What would you say the big difference is between acting uh, you know, semi professionally on stage uh as opposed to, you know, making YouTube videos ranting and raving and, you know, trying to get your message across? The, the utter lack of audience. Um, if, you, if you go back and look at my, uh, my early YouTube videos, man, I was fucking, I was so uncomfortable uh, talking to no one. Uh, it sounds that, really, is, that is difficult to overcome. It is. Uh, it sounds really cliche, but the audience, having a live audience, I think I'd have the same trouble if I ever did any, any uh, you know, movie work. Because having a live audience there, there is an energy that flows back and forth between the performer and the audience that's just not, it's not fucking there uh, with YouTube. And so learning how to speak to this quick cam orbit MP that I have, like it's a, a you know, 7,000 people, I think that's the main difference. I always, um, you know, I, I've never been an entertainer or, you know, uh trying to you know perform on stage or anything like that i mean you know maybe maybe a few times in school or, but you know one thing i always was is i was always a very good conversationalist always very good at talking to people and, and you know very good at making one person laugh so I always just try to envision the camera as you know my best friend like someone that i can just relax around and be honest i don't have to put on any uh, any airs or um, yeah, yeah, no, I, that, that's that's a good tactic. I I was never able to fool myself into thinking that the camera was my best friend, um, so I try and I try and imagine an audience, you know. And that was hard at, at first when I didn't have a fucking audience, but now that I do, um, trying to conduct myself like there's six or seven thousand people listening to me speak is is yeah. It's very difficult because it's very counterintuitive. I mean, you know, even though you know the people are out there listening, it's a uh, it's very difficult to, to convince yourself of that on a visceral level. Uh-huh. I mean, that was one of the difficult – I mean, even I would say my first 200 videos that I made, I mean, I was still struggling with that. Uh, it took me a long time to, to gather that. I mean, I, I think that was 
you know, I mean, I've been I've made so many videos now, but um. Well, I tell you what, if you were uncomfortable talking to the mic uh, or talking to the camera within your first couple of hundred videos, you hit it well because I, I've been a ground floor subscriber. I, I don't, I don't know if I was there at the very beginning, but I remember your first 200 videos, and uh, if you were uncomfortable, you hit it well. I was extraordinarily uncomfortable. Um, I mean, I, I still get uncomfortable in front of camera some days. Unlike myself, uh, where uh, you go back and watch my first five or ten videos, and it's painful. <laughs> yeah, you did suck. You know, one, one, of my, one of my favorite things is, and I wanted to bring it up during this interview, was how I initially got my, my start on YouTube. Uh, was making a response to you, and you and your brother uh, shit all over me for about <laughs> fifteen fucking minutes. And, uh, yeah, that was uh, that was that was pretty classic. I've left I've left that video up just purely to remind myself how not to be, because I'm telling you, if you were you were terrible. Yeah. I remember um, I don't I, I remember thinking that you were the the biggest turnaround I ever saw in a channel like. You just went from like the stereotypical, absolutely unwatchably boring <laughs> YouTuber to like literally the person who I mean, like I always, I mean, I, I mean, no one encapsulates how I feel about any specific issue better than you do. You well, know, you, you always seem to manage to just you know say the right thing at the right time. Well, having praise heaped on you by somebody that you've looked up to since you started making YouTube videos is incredibly uncomfortable. Having having <laughs> having praise heaped on you by anybody. I, I remember um, uh, just yesterday, Fake Sagan was telling me that he was shocked to find out that you're actually a year younger than he is. Yeah, it's, yeah. He said it made him feel ancient. I was surprised too because I, I know that you must know that you look older than yes, you are. Yes, yes, that's which yeah. is a which is a problem I I've actually. Uh, had in my life well not really a problem but i mean people have always thought i'm older i, yeah. I usually get people telling me yeah, they thought i was in my 30s or something yeah i get um and you know it's it's kind of sad i try not uh not to let it affect my self-esteem but when somebody <laughs> tells you they had you pegged at late 30s it's and you're, and you're fucking 27 or 28 years old you know it's 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 that's a tough one to swallow People tell me, people tell me like all the time, like, "Oh, I thought you were in your early 30s." I'm like, "Fuck you! I'm only 24. I'm damn. I, I still, man, it's amazing how 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 quickly in life you start to feel old, though. Oh, dude. At least for me. I mean, I thought it was something that happened in your 40s, but I already feel like. And I, and to be honest with you, not to speak for your for your situation, but I think the fat thing has something to do with it. I think, yeah. I think fat people start to feel old about 20 or 30 years before fit people do because I, I'm totally with you. I remember, you know, I'm still 29. I remember being 23, 24, having all this energy and shit, and now I can barely roll my tub of fucking lard out of bed in the morning. <laughs> like I oh, I know, what, I know what you mean. Um, you know, yeah, I, I think that does contribute because every time I've ever gone on one of my moderately – successful, highly temporary diets and lost a little bit of weight. People always say, oh, you look younger. You look you look so much better and stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, just recently, I mean, you can look at my YouTube videos and see my yo-yo dieting ass fucking go from 300 to 230 <laughs> and then back to 300 again in the span yeah. of 70 fucking videos, you know. And, yeah, as soon as you drop a little bit of weight, people tell you, oh, man, you're like a new person. You've got all this energy. You look so good. Yeah, fuck you. Hey, you ever notice that? Uh, you ever notice that you don't have all that energy, though? I yeah. think it just—I think you just look like you do. Right. Like I don't—I've lost a ton of weight. And I never felt like any great surge of energy. In fact, I felt miserable because I couldn't eat what I wanted to. No, I think—I think what it is is you—you you look like you could run from one end of your living room to the next without taking a break in the middle. And I think that people <laughs> assume that equates that you've got all this fucking energy when you really don't. Yeah, I think uh, maybe my public persona is deceptive too in that in that respect. Since yeah. I'm always like a hyper maniac on camera, yeah, they don't realize I have to lie down for for several hours afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> have your uh, have your lady friend bring you a a cold drink and rub your feet for a while after a video. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. Well, you know, that's like. Uh, man, as soon as I start interviewing, everyone wants to be interviewed now. I've been, like, struggling to get interviews, and now I get you on the line, and everyone's like, interview me now, interview me now. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah. It's, uh, I, I want to know, um, you know, uh, 
l- let's talk about something a little bit more substantive here for a second, because you have a lot of um, of important videos. Okay. Um, one thing, uh, your, your most recent video, I, I, the most recent one I saw anyway, you were talking about how, um, you know, uh, you were no longer uh, content to um, uh, leave well enough alone and, and just, uh, you know, bygones be bygones and let's all just get along and, you know, I'm just... I don't care if you accept me as long as you don't fuck with me. But you're no longer to, you know, content with that attitude, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm not. And that was that was a tough that was a tough realization to come to because I'd operated, you know, ever since I'd, I'd admitted to myself that I was an atheist, I'd operated under the under the assumption that it would be okay if people could just live and let live. And, uh, you know, I, I can be an atheist, and as long as you don't seek to directly fuck with me, what you think about me in your private life, you think I'm a scumbag, you think I'm uh, in a demon spawn, whatever, as long as you don't seek to fuck with me. And it was a hard realization for me to come to that that just doesn't fucking work. If it did work, you know, if it, w- if it was black and white like that, then great, I'd be perfectly happy with it. But I don't, I don't trust that humanity has the capacity to live and let live. I think that... I think that that sort of attitude, that whole separate but equal thing, not to, not to do the cliche and, and, and try and compare the, the atheist struggle to the civil <laughs> rights struggle, but you know that whole separate but equal thing, I think we've got proof, right, that that doesn't work. Don't you, uh, don't you kind of have a suspicion that, that really that's about as good as you can get from, from humanity? Like – you know, that's the best you can hope for is just a, a cynical, you know, well, I don't like how they what they do, but I'll kind of leave them alone kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, do you really think they're even capable of true acceptance of, of other ideas or true acceptance of, of people who are different than them? Do you, have you ever seen The NeverEnding Story? The NeverEnding Story. Yeah, of course I've okay. seen The NeverEnding Story. You know at the end when the princess comes to Bastion and she gives him the one grain of sand that's left of their world? Yeah. That one grain of sand is what's left of my faith in humanity. Um, <laughs> it's, a really, it's a really good analogy because honestly, yes, 99.99% of me screams exactly what you just said, that that's the best we're ever going to get. We'll be lucky if we get that. Um, but there's this one tiny little speck of hope that uh, you know that I keep that I that I keep hammering away at, hoping that things can possibly turn around and get better. I love how you turned a reference to a, a delightful children's <laughs> film into one of the most cynical statements I've ever heard. That's a uh, that's quite beautiful. Um, you, you you and I, uh, I think you and I are alike in that respect uh, because. Uh, I mean, it's the it's it's basically. Do you ever read uh, George Carlin's introduction to uh, his first book? I, I forget the title. I think it was uh, Napalm and Silly Putty, or I'm sure I have at some point. It's been forever, though. I I remember there was a you know his his basically he was just saying how um, it was basically just a, you know fuck hope fuck humanity right you know that that was basically the the sentiment expressed there, but it was it was also a. a, a he was also talking about how he was personally an optimist, but just a pessimist about humanity and the world around him and, and all that stuff. Right, right. Uh, that's and a, I can kind of relate to that. I can, I can more than kind of relate to that. That's, that's, <laughs> that's my life in a nutshell. <laughs> well, you know, I, you know um, I just wonder um, if you think that, that there – you know, do, do you hold out any belief – whatsoever that that we can even make a, a a small little amount of progress in the future or do you think that this is just going to be uh, an ongoing cycle where we're constantly well I would say struggling against our demons but we're barely putting up a fight I mean you understand that right uh, do you think we're just going it's just going to be a you know a, a non-stop history of corruption from generation to generation and it's never going to improve that that tidal wave of stupidity that I was talking about earlier that generational stupidity is the reason why you look at my channel and you see 70 videos and you see eight month gaps in between my videos because I reach a point where I start to feel like I'm hammering my head against a fucking brick wall that's never going to fall over and that you know if, if that's the truth then why am I making videos uh, other than to serve my my ego and to, to have the you know 99% of people that watch my videos give me the thumbs up and the great video and praise me and tell me how fucking wonderful I am 
uh, when I may as well just be speaking to myself, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't genuinely, I'd be a liar if I told you I held out more than that one tiny little speck of genuine hope that things are actually going to improve. Um, <laughs> I just don't. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the encouraging thing to me is that I do think that things are better now than they have been in the past, but at the same time, I recognize it as largely a, a, a facade on the part of humanity. Right. You know, the the beast is just under this like thin patina of civility that mm-hmm. we that we're wearing in our day to day lives, and I know that it could come rising back up at any moment. And in in most places in the world, it's still right there on the surface. Right. I mean, you go to the Congo or Haiti or you know uh, anywhere in the Middle East, you're gonna you're gonna find that that same beast. It's just, you know, you know, even in some parts of the American South, you know, you're going to find it right there on the surface. It's even beyond the South. I mean, it's, it's, well, it's, you know. it's right on the surface everywhere. I mean, uh, look at – I think, you know, you, you got – you have uh, the, the mentality where, you know, uh, the racist – you know, you know, I mean, there, here, here's a good example. I mean, the, you know, Southern racist, I mean, you know, it used to be, you know, hey, look at that nigger. Let's, uh, let's go hang him from the highest tree. You know, now you have these southern businessmen saying, "Oh, we'll we'll stay away from that area because there's a lot of Democrats in that area." Right. And right. If Democrats is, of course, their you know yeah. slang for for blacks. Right. You know, I, you know, it, it's still racism. It's still you know stupid, vacuous bigotry. But at least it's you know it's not as overt. It's very it's, it's you know sort of veiled and it's yeah. I mean it's it not it's not right sense of civility in there. It's not right there in your face like it like it you know was 30 40 years ago. But um, for me to for me to look at the fact that racists have finally gotten it through their thick skulls that they can't be overtly racist. So so they're going to stuff it way down deep inside of themselves and still hate you know still hate every minority on the planet and just call it something else i don't i, I have a hard time calling that progress uh, that's just I, I i know what you mean but uh, you know at the same time it, it you know at least it 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 it, it hints that, that that maybe some part of them acknowledges that this behavior is not acceptable right hence hence the tiny little spark the the one grain of sand that left from uh, the beautiful world of now, what, what, was you, fucking, uh, what was that fucking you, world called, by the way? Do you remember? Uh, Fantasia, wasn't it? Yeah, Fantasia. There it is. Yeah, you had um, you, you had a, 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 a an ex- you experienced uh, the violent side of humanity yourself when you were you were younger. Yeah. Uh, you were uh, uh, I guess attacked and you know had your shit stolen from you. Uh huh. Stripped butt naked and made to run out in the middle <laughs> Left of in the, in the countryside. <laughs> right, right. You know, um, uh, you know the, the cop afterwards, he told you that you were lucky they didn't kill you because usually in instances like that, they do. Yeah. Do, did you, uh, did you, you know, have you ever, you know, contemplated that and wondered why, you, you know, they didn't? Honestly, every day, every day. At some point during the day, even if it's just for a second or two, um, I contemplate that because the cop was right. You know, why would these guys have picked me up, taken me out in the middle of fucking nowhere, and made me strip naked if they just meant to turn me loose so I could go to the cops and get them caught? You know, I, I fully, genuinely believe that they had every intention of killing me. Why they didn't, that question, uh, you know, not to be cliche, but it's going to haunt me. You know, that's always going to be in the back of my mind. It's always going to be something I think about. Um, and I don't have an answer for it. Does coming that close to death, uh, uh, you know, you know, and, and being in such a desperate and helpless situation, I mean, how does that affect the rest of your life? Does that give you an appreciation or does it just let you know how easily life can fuck you at any time? Uh, you know, it's a little bit of both, I think. Uh, I think appreciation a lot of times flows from the fact that that you learn that life can fuck you right up the ass at any moment. Um, so appreciate each day that it doesn't. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, you know that that's kind of that's kind of yeah. I mean, it's what it really has done for me 
and a lot of people ask me, it was two black guys that did that to me, and a lot of people ask me if I'm afraid of, of black people and be, because of that. And mm. the, the answer is honestly, at first, yes, I was. At first, yes, I would give a sidelong glance to every black guy I saw walking down the street at night. Um, but what it's kind of developed into, which is it's kind of sad that I find this to be more healthy, I'm just afraid of people. Yeah, I'm just afraid of people in general. Uh, well, you know, uh, Fake Sagan and I uh, have a kind of a crackpot theory, but I think it has some merit to it, that the reason for the popularity of, uh, of zombie movies is because that's what we're really afraid of more than anything is the faceless masses, each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're surrounded by strangers all day, every day. I mean, you know, we're, we're a, a you know species that evolved in groups uh, that were consisted of our families and... Uh, yeah. You know, our tribesmen, and we knew everybody, and suddenly we find ourselves thrust into a world full of uh, strangers. You know, I, I think that that's, you know, where you get this this uh, paranoia, this, uh, you know, fear of each other. And, uh, you know, I think that's expressed in, in those zombie movies. But um, Yeah, I wouldn't call that a crackpot theory, by the way. I mean, if you're any type of a zombie movie fan and you haven't picked up on the social commentary yet, then I don't know what to yeah. tell you. I mean, it's, well, yeah, it's there. Yeah, yeah, Romero, you know, will, will drive the point home, but most of the other people who do zombie movies really don't. You know, right, right. <laughs> you know, it's it's usually just, hey, look at the spooky dead guys. Right. But I think, you know, on a subconscious level, you know, certainly it's there. And with Romero's works and maybe a few other, other people, it's there on a very conscious level. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I guess I have to ask you, since you are an actor and you you you, you know you do act uh, well, and I've seen you uh, do performance pieces on YouTube in the uh-huh. past, and I was always uh, fairly impressed, like the your, your reading from uh, from Network. But um, what what are your some of your favorite movies? Favorite movies? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not asking for like a rigid top ten or something. Just right. you know, a, a few movies that you you have a deep appreciation of. I'm a huge, uh, you know, surprise surprise Stanley Kubrick fan. Um, yeah, everyone I, loves Kubrick. Yeah, I, I don't know how you couldn't love Kubrick. In fact, I've got friends that don't love Kubrick, and I, I well, wonder. Well, they sh- they shouldn't be friends yeah, anymore. Yeah, exactly. Uh. I, I wonder why I hang out with those people. <laughs> um, I, I I have a, an abiding love for Jim Cameron's Aliens. I yeah. just that movie for for whatever reason I could just watch that movie once a day and never get tired of it. Uh, the same thing goes for the Big Lebowski. Uh, that that's that's yeah, another one yeah. of those movies that I could just watch over. John Goodman in that movie, he just rivets me. I, I get a lot of comparisons to John Goodman. A lot of a lot of my subscribers will comment that I look like John Goodman or sound like John Goodman, and that's that's one of the that's one of the biggest compliments you can pay me because that fucking. What did guy. you? Would you have liked to uh, to play that character? Uh, y- yes, but I-, I couldn't have done it nearly as well as he did. Uh, I'm no. Uh, I- I'm, I'm 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 kind of sad uh, to not see him in as much anymore. Yeah. Um, did you? Uh, I wonder if I wonder if he's just uh, you know too unhealthy or something because I, of I, his his extreme weight problems. I hope not, but you're probably that's probably it. Yeah. 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 Uh, I I have to wonder. Um, you know, you, you say you're a fan of Kubrick. I have to ask what your opinion is on on the movie that really divides Kubrick fans. Uh, you know, his last film, Eyes Wide Shut. What what did you think of that? Uh, it was a it was a turd. It was a turd. <laughs> it was it was the one Kubrick movie that uh, I've watched once, and I don't think I will ever have the need to watch again. Um, <laughs> I don't know what it was. I don't know if he was uh, losing his mind in his old age and his ill health. I don't know what it was. But for some reason, it, and it's something that I would never say about a Kubrick film, it seemed like he was trying too hard. Um, <laughs> and Do you uh, – let, so, so let me ask you, uh, what, is, what, are, what are some of your favorite Kubrick films? Because I'm, I'm a fellow Kubrick fan. My, my absolute number one favorite Kubrick film is uh, A Clockwork Orange. And it will always be so. Uh, that 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 book. I read the book actually before I ever saw the movie. I had a friend. I, I actually uh, I was con- contemplating buying the book yesterday, but I just thought the film would just tinge my perception of it a bit too much. It you know, having done it the other way around, I'm not sure, but I can tell you that the film is an absolutely great representation of the overall theme of the book. Um, just the language that's used in it. I, I'm a big fan of, of, of the use of language in movies, and this yeah, they call it yeah. NADSAT in the book. This, this which thing. is which is kind of a 
you know, which is really a, a something that's kind of really gone the way of the dinosaur in, in a lot of modern movies. It seems right. like language is really an, an undervalued tool nowadays. Right. It's just dumbed down completely. It's, I mean, that's the, num- that's the one reason uh, why I have such an abiding love for Shakespeare. I mean, some of my favorite, uh, some of the favorite shows I've ever done have been Shakespeare shows just because uh, of the language and the, and the wordplay. And, and you're right. It's something that you just don't see. And I think A Clockwork Orange is a, is a rare yeah. example of a modern film where you get to it's see a, it. It's great. Plus there's that rape scene. I, I always like movies with rape in it. Uh, uh, yeah. Singing in the Rain. Yeah, I mean that's that's such a dark moment. It's like just like when you took. Uh, I, I always love anything that juxtaposes the innocent and childlike with the very dark, right? And and you know macabre. I mean that's that's how I got into to Marilyn Manson initially because he was taking uh you know you know s- soundtracks from Scooby Doo and and you know uh, segments from Willy Wonka and, and really showing the dark underbelly. That's why. I was I, I always uh, I liked that scene because it, it juxtaposes um, the very very dark act of rape by this gang of of hooligans as a uh, as I guess they would be called and and you know this nice little show tune singing in the rain you know and it's it's just such it's so dark it's just like how you took the analogy about um, Fantasia and the one little speck of Fantasia left and then turned it into this cynical observation about how empty you are as a human being. Uh, right, and in a, and in a great... And in my, a, my, my favorite, uh, I think my favorite Kubrick film, I would have said A Clockwork Orange, but I saw Dr. Strangelove uh, uh, just uh, maybe a few months ago, not even a year ago, yeah. and, I, and I have to say that that usurped uh, A Clockwork Orange for me, but I, I like all of his films. I even liked Eyes Wide Shut, although I do admit that it is his worst film. Yeah. Well, maybe Lolita. I didn't like Lolita very much either and i won't but, argue with you the the brilliance of dr strangelove uh it's not number two for me it's a tough it's a tough thing to rank kubrick films in my mind number two would have to be uh full metal jacket and you know i i i, I can't really i can't watch those because I, I i just i can't watch war movies i just yeah, don't like them and i understand that but uh it, you know it, it's got a, like a personal tinge for me because mm-hmm. uh matthew modine in that movie he looks exactly like my dad it looks exactly huh. like my dad's basic training photo, and my dad was in the army during uh, in the army, not the not the Marines, like in the movie during Nam. But yeah, it's always kind of a weird, surreal thing to watch that because I always end up identifying that main character with my father. That is very strange. Uh, so you were talking about Shakespeare a little earlier. Let's let's get into that a little bit. Okay. Uh, you've uh, how many what, what, how many Shakespearean uh, plays have you acted in? Uh, let me. I mean, uh, quite a few. Uh, I've I tend, it, with, with regards to Shakespeare, I tend to get cast in, in uh, comedic roles, and I'm perfectly okay <laughs> with that. Um, I yeah. only recently, you know, in doing theater, started to get some serious roles, but I just don't fit the body type or the personality type or the voice type of a, of a uh, non-comedic role. So I, my, my favorite role of all time is Sir Toby Belch from Twelfth Night. Um, mm-hmm. That's a great uh, just a fucking wonderful role. Uh, close runner-up would be Caliban from The Tempest. I got to play Caliban uh, from The Tempest, who's this you know sea monster who kind of <laughs> capers in and out of uh, the scenes and ends up playing a, a, a much larger role. He's almost like I've o- I've often wondered if Caliban was a was an inspiration for the Gollum character because he's he's almost like Gollum. He's this kind of twisted, monstrous, uh, comedic thing that ends up playing a much bigger role than than uh, anyone thought he was going to by the end of the play. Let me ask you a question. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I, you, you know, I'm sure you you seem to be a lover of film and a lover of Shakespeare. What do you think the best uh, adaptation of a Shakespeare play to film has been? This is this is a really loaded question for me. Now wait, now, now let me let me let me just uh, let me just say like it doesn't. I'm just gonna you know it doesn't have to be a, a direct adaptation where they you actually use his play as, as the script. I mean it can just be based on on his story. It doesn't necessarily have to use his original dialogue. Right. You know, I have such a hard time with this shit because any any time. I'm a lover of theater first and foremost. I'm a film lover, but theater is where my yeah. passion is at. And it's so hard for me because I think theater is so undermined and, and is kind of on the downslope. You know, less and less people are interested in it. Movies have obviously usurped theater long ago, but 
uh, you know, it's just becoming less and less popular. And anytime I see a movie that draws its direct, uh, even if it's not a, a direct adaptation, just, just the story, um, it bothers me because I'm like, you could have seen this on stage in such a different setting, in such a, in such a, in the setting it was written for. You know, one of the one of the worst things I see is are these musicals that are being released as movies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I'm a musical theater actor. I don't have the greatest voice, so I haven't done much musical theater since college. But um, I just I love musical theater. And well, yeah, okay. But surely there has been something that just did it so well that you have to begrudgingly admit that it was fucking awesome. Uh, you know, I would I would honestly have to think about it. I I, I hate to leave the question hanging like that, but I'm <laughs> but I'm so fucking. Uh, it turns me off on such a fundamental level when a, when a movie uh, takes from a stage show. That I'm sure you're right, but I'll be goddamned if I can think of one. <laughs> you're such a purist. I know. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I I I'll, I'll um, you know, I, I think the the. I think that there's always going to be theaters, just like I think there's always going to be books. I don't think any art forms really have ever died off in human history, regardless of how many supposedly, uh, you know, superior mediums arise. You know, yeah. uh, you know, you know, people think that, um, uh, you know, the, the movies, movies were going to kill books and going to kill, you know, theater, and you know, yet. There's you know tons of shows on on Broadway that you know and even off Broadway that people still pay big money to see and yeah. people still flood into bookstores. I mean every time I go to Barnes and Noble it's packed. And of course you, you know, know and I realize completely that that my position on that is totally like it's stupid because what probably happens more often than not is that people who never would have gone and seen a, a show live in the theater go and watch Mamma Mia. Or uh, you know any of these other the Phantom of the Opera or whatever the fuck, and it creates a new fan. It creates a person that if that show were to go on tour, might buy a ticket and go sit their ass in the seat. So I, I realize it's like that. I'm just really I, for for whatever reason I I've always held that position and I'm super defensive of it. Um, you are a rational bastard. I tell you what. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me let me um just uh. I, I just want to ask you a few more questions about about YouTube because that's really the uh, the core of this conversation, I suppose. That's really where most people know you from. Hit me. I want to ask you just what is you know I, I, I mean I already know the answer to this question, but I'm just curious to hear your answer. Um, how do you find that the dynamic of your channel and your relationship to your audience changes as it grows larger? You learn to hate your audience. <laughs> um, you, when you when you've got a small channel, and I had a relatively small channel for a good little chunk of time, two, three, four hundred subscribers, before you uh, destroyed all of that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, no, but you know when you've got a smaller, more intimate group of people, it's easier to see um, faces in the crowd, I guess. And the larger your audience get uh, gets, the more you start to feel that they're sycophants who would, uh, you know five star you and favorite you all over every page that they possibly had access to if you made a video of yourself picking your nose for half an hour you know and i've really i've genuinely come to believe that that's the truth it might not be the truth but i've learned to to uh despise my audience a, a little bit you know it's a, it's a love hate you know, thing it's, it's for, not for, for for that exact reason every once in a while i will make a video that is just intentionally stupid and pointless <laughs> And see, I wish, I wish that I had the balls to do something like that. One, one of the reasons why you don't see me making a lot of YouTube videos is I start to feel like I'm in a rut. And when I look at you, when TJ starts to feel like he's in a rut, he makes a video about something else. He moves on to another topic. I mean, you, you mentioned it in a video a while back that I was watching, and I was like, fucking A. You're like, I'm the amazing atheist, and I don't really like making videos about atheism anymore. And if I don't want to, I'm fucking not going to. And You, you know, know what's weird is that my last three videos have actually been I know. about atheism. I know. So I, I guess I'm getting a little bit of a resurgence there. You know what happened? You know, this my, my girlfriend... She had this cockamamie scheme to get me talking about atheism again, and it fucking worked. Yeah, see? She, see, here's what happened. She gave, she told me that she had a friend of hers that wanted to talk to me. Right. And I talked to this guy, and he was literally the dumbest fucking person I have ever met in my life. Uh. 
Look, he did not believe in he was okay. His first thing is like, "Why do you hate God?" I'm like, "I don't hate God. I don't really want to even talk about that. That's really not even." But he kept wanting to talk about it, so I started talking, and I told him like, you know. He said, like, I was in a car accident, and I survived, and that's why there's a God. I'm like, don't you under- – like, that's just the law of probability. He's like, right. I don't believe in probability. I'm like, what? Oh, Jesus. How do you not believe in fucking probability? <laughs> that was the point where I'm just like, what the fuck is going on? This world deserves to die. Uh, I, 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 I feel a great – I felt a great surge of sympathy for the Old Testament God flooding the earth at yeah. that point. Uh-huh. I just wish he would have just fucking – completed the job fuck noah fuck the ark just right. kill everybody because right. it's not working this fucking experiment has failed yep i know i'm i'm with you there i i find myself sometimes wishing i was religious so i wouldn't uh i wouldn't feel stupid when i pray every other night for the south to fall into the fucking ocean <laughs> um or for, pray that pray that i'm on vacation <laughs> right time, right least. yeah the, the the very few people of worth that I know in the South, you know, they they could be in a boat. They could just happen to be in a landlocked boat when it happens. But the rest of them, I, you know, they could drown, and I wouldn't really fucking care. So I, I definitely you know, s- save New Orleans because this is this this city is badass. You know, I wish I wish I could go to New Orleans because I'm in dire need of something about the South to improve my fucking image of it because. Right now, it's pretty much, yeah, a couple of family members that I have that I wouldn't want to see drown, you and a couple of friends. Uh, other than that. <laughs> you know, I got to admit, I, 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 as a Southern boy, I got to admit that, uh, you know, yeah, I think uh, I think 98% of the South could, could happily fall into the ocean and only improve the state of the nation. Of course, I'm an equal opportunity uh, Armageddon wisher. I, about half of California could fall into the ocean, too, and I'd be perfectly happy with that. <laughs> All of coastal California, except for Pismo Beach, could uh, cease to exist, and I wouldn't. Cry you're, 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 you're looking. Uh, you're looking forward to swimming in Arizona Bay, I uh, guess. Huh? Yes, yes, as, <laughs> as Maynard said. <laughs> well, a- anyway, um, I, I guess we've been going on a little long. This has actually been the longest of my three interviews, but hey, cool. I, I, you know, the three interviews I've had so far. But so far, you've been the most interesting of the three people I've interviewed. Fucking a. So. Uh, uh, much much obliged, sir. Hey, uh, my and uh, if you do you have any last words to the audience before you you bid uh, bid them adieu? Uh, yeah, to my subscribers. In fact, in, to to everyone's subscribers. If if you take one piece of advice from me, add something other than blind acclaim. Add something to to the discussion. And if you have nothing but blind acclaim to add to the discussion, rethink making the comment uh, there you go that's all i got i wish i had something more profound than that <laughs> well it works whatever <laughs> what the fuck ever <laughs> watch the never-ending story that's a good movie yeah, yeah all right all right well my pleasure tj and uh i will uh i'll see you on sunday see you sir all right bye bye <laughs>